city work day um, for our junior high mission trip or VBS that just happened a few weeks ago. Um, and they probably thought, y'all probably thought you could get away from me. And you can't. I'm here. All right. It's good to be with you this morning. We're going to be in um, John 9. Uh, like Aaron said, he said I could do whatever I wanted. So we're in John 9. We're looking at the story of Jesus and the blind beggar this morning. Um, we're going to read that in a second. If you want to turn there in your Bibles or phones or whatever you got. Um, I was trying to work out this sermon amidst like a bunch of other things that I had going on in my head. And uh, if you know me, you know I'm not really good at that. So I was trying to kind of uncloud uh, my mind. And what I've done once or twice before when I've been kind of, you know, if my mind has been kind of um, clouded and I've been stuck in what I've been trying to think in terms of like planning things or working out sermons, uh, is I went to the art museum. I went to the art museum, not because I'm a super cultured person, but because it just helps me um, think to wander around, sit in a chair with a journal and work on a sermon. Um, and I did that. And I was, you know, just kind of aimlessly wandering around, and I got um, stuck on a painting, looked at a, a painting. And the first thing that struck me in this painting was um, it, it was of people desperately clinging to lifeboats. People desperately clinging to lifeboats. It was actually a picture of the sinking of the Titanic. So the Titanic's off sinking in the background. The sky is red with flames. And everybody in the painting is clinging to lifeboats. Some of the boats are like flipped over or tipping. The painting was by a German named Max Beckman. I'm not pronouncing that in a German way, sorry. But Max Beckman. Um, and he actually started it within a few months of the sinking of the Titanic. Because he was so... Um, he was so hit by the stories that he had heard coming out of the Titanic of um, the desperate clinging to the lifeboats. And I was kind of looking around next to it, struck by the painting next to it, and I saw that was also by Max Beckman. And I thought, oh, wow, that's cool. Turns out the whole room is, it, it, it was a Max Beckman room, right? I missed the big statue of his face on the way in. Um, but the other painting that I saw was called Christ in the Sinner. And it was a picture... There's a painting of the story of Jesus and the woman caught in adultery. He dramatically painted the crowds. All of them had accusatory, angry faces. One art critic actually called it um, a drama of hands because of how much is being communicated in the hands that Beckman drew. Some of them had spears. Some of them had rocks. One man had his, uh, like just a ridiculous face with a nose turned upward and an accusatory finger pointed at the woman. And the woman is kneeling at, at Jesus' feet. Um, her chest is actually exposed. I don't think that was a, you know, a sexual thing or even calling back to her sin, but I think that was exposing her vulnerability. It was showing her vulnerability in the situation. Her hands are clasped. and She's begging for Jesus' help. She's in a very desperate position. Jesus stands. He stands. So the woman's over here. She's begging for Jesus' help. The crowd is over here. And Jesus has one hand extended, holding back the crowd with the spears and the stones, and one hand embracing the woman. A lot of Beckman's work was focused on desperation. I learned, um, did some research on him. I learned he was actually in the trenches of World War I where he was a medic and he experienced horrific things. He was later exiled after the Nazis declared him to be a cultural Bolshevik. And he fled to the U.S. where he became an art professor here in St. Louis at Washington University. Through all this adversity, he experienced humanity in its most desperate form. And he reflected a lot of that in his art. The theme throughout is a titanic piece and the other tragedies he draws to the woman begging at Jesus' feet is desperation. And that's what we're looking at today in this passage of Jesus and the blind man. We're going to see a desperate man, a man who could do nothing and bring nothing to Jesus. And my hope is that we can see a little bit of ourselves and our desperation a bit in this man by the end of the sermon today. So if you want to look with me, John 9, it's long. I, we're doing the whole chapter. The whole chapter, it's one story, right? Um, so settle in. Um, let's follow Jesus as he 
um, has this interaction with the blind man. As he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth, and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, It was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said these things, he spit on the ground and made mud with the saliva. Then he anointed the man's eyes with mud and said to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. So he washed, and he came back seeing. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar were saying, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some said, It is he. Others said, No, but he's like him. He kept saying, I am the man. So they said to him, Then how were your eyes open? He answered, The man called Jesus made mud and anointed my eyes and said to me, Go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, Where is he? He said, I do not know. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. Now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. So the Pharisees again asked him how he had received his sight. And he said to them, He put mud in my eyes, and I washed, and I see. Some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others said, How can a man who is a sinner do such signs? There is a division among them. So they said to the blind man, What do you say about him, since he has opened your eyes? He said, He is a prophet. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked them, Is this your son, who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered, We know that this is our son and that he was born blind, but how he sees now we don't know. But we do know, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him, he is of age, he will speak for himself. Now his parents said these things because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that if anyone should confess Jesus to be the Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue. Therefore his parents said, He is of age, ask him. So for the second time they called the man who had been blind and said to him, Give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered, Whether he is a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. They said to him, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered him, I have told you already, and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? And they reviled him, saying, You are his disciple." But we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we don't know where he comes from. The man answered, Why, this is an amazing thing. You don't know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. Never since the beginning of the world has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. This man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, You were born in utter sin, and you would take, teach us? And they cast him out. Jesus heard that they cast him out, and having found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, And who is it, who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and it is he who is speaking to you. He said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. Jesus said, for judgment I came into this world that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard these things and said to him, Are we also blind? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say, We see, your guilt remains. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about what that story means for us. So going back to the beginning, um, verse 1, Jesus saw this man who is known to have been born blind, and his disciples asked, who sinned? This guy or his parents? And I don't want you guys to miss the craziness here, because he is actually asking, did this guy sin in his womb? So they had this, you know, this theology that um, you could sin in, um, sin in your mother's womb. Or did he sin in his, like, prenatal soul? Or did his mom sin when he was in the womb? Like, whose who's, who's, who's sin caused this? And this question was reflective of a widespread belief of the Jews at the time that for serious things like this, serious diseases like this, somebody was to blame. 
You can label that a number of ways. You can call it karma. You could also call it a form of the prosperity gospel, right? Like, if you obey God, if you follow God, you get good stuff. Do good, get good. Follow Jesus, get health, wealth, and prosperity. Don't believe, get sin, sickness, and poverty. That's what, that, a form of that prosperity gospel is actually, it seems like, what the disciples were inclined to here. And we'll see that's what the Pharisees actually believe, looking like a lot of Job's friends. There are people who will tell you that. There are churches you can go to this morning that will tell you that. But Jesus here is saying, no, that's not how it works. Jesus knew himself that he would have to suffer on the cross for sins that weren't his. So he says, no, neither of those, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. So there's a purpose here, and we're going to find out what it is. So this guy is desperate, right? He can't see. He can't work. So the only other way he could survive is by begging. And that's what everybody knew him for. That's what he's called here, right? The blind beggar. We don't get a name for this guy. He's the blind beggar. And here, Jesus says, he actually is calling back to um, when he said he's the light of the world. If you look at um, verse 5, he said, As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And Jesus just gave a whole, this is a few chapters before in the Gospel of John, um, probably just a f few weeks um, before this. And Jesus here is giving an example of that. He's giving an example of how he's the light of the world. He's setting up to show that he's the light of the world. And he comes to this guy who's lived his entire life in darkness, literal darkness, and he sets out to give him light. So that's what Jesus is kind of referring to when he says that the works of God might be displayed in him. He's going to show that he's the light of the world. So Jesus spits on the ground. He made mud, and he rubbed it in his eyes. Jesus actually likes to spit. We see this in the Gospels a couple of times um, in his other healings. Guys are like, yeah, spit. I don't know what it is. Like when I'm walking around, it's only when I'm walking around outside with a group of guys that I just have the inclination to, you know. Um, the psychologist should study that. But we, we don't really know why Jesus does this. There's a few theories out there. One of the theories that some commentators have is that um, he's actually doing an act of recreation. So how God like breathed and breathed and he uh, you know, just through his words, he made everything, that Jesus is actually, um, as the second Adam, he's spitting into the ground, he's recreating through the mud. That could be. Um, I have no idea, actually. You know, I, I don't know, and nobody's for sure on what it means. But it seems pretty clear here that the miracle that Jesus does requires the blind beggar to acknowledge his desperate need. It required faith and trust in Jesus, who he couldn't even see on the part of the blind man. And he did what Jesus said. He went and washed, and he saw. Has anybody ever seen videos of um, colorblind people that wear those special glasses, and, like, they see color for the first time, and, like, their reaction is just awesome? Imagine that, but with this blind beggar who had never seen anything. He hadn't seen color. He hadn't even seen light. And all of a sudden, he sees light and color and beauty for the first time ever. Imagine his reaction to that. And then immediately, so the text goes, and he saw, and then immediately we start with an investigation. Um, it happens in four quick scenes, and if you've ever seen like a Monty Python movie, you can kind of imagine like how this plays out in a Monty Python movie because it's kind of hilarious. Um, it gets pretty ridiculous. So let's look at the first scene. The first scene are the people that know him, his neighbors. The neighbors who were used to this man, as in verse 8, as just a beggar. They knew this guy, he was a blind beggar. And even though some of them might have seen him every day, they weren't used to him seeing with his eyes open, walking around without assistance. So he said, yep, it's me. This is what happened. And they asked where Jesus was, and he said, oh, I don't know. So they bring the man to the Pharisees, the religious elite. 
so they could look into it. They wanted them to check into it. So we have the second scene, the Pharisees. This becomes where the fact that the healing was on the Sabbath becomes important because the Pharisees set strict laws on the Sabbath that went even farther than the Bible does. So they had 39 categories of prohibited actions on the Sabbath, and Jesus could have broken a bunch of them. I was looking at a few of them, and, you know, if you're getting li really litigious, you know, you could have made that into, like, five different violations, right? Like, um, healing a person who wasn't dying. Uh, one category is needing, like needing bread. So maybe Jesus making mud could have broken that. There's a bunch of stuff that Jesus could have done wrong here, according to the Pharisees' made-up laws. And Jesus broke a lot of them. By my count, we see Jesus heal um, seven times throughout the Gospels on the Sabbath, and that's over a third of all the times Jesus heals. We see Jesus healing people in the New Testament. And so it's, it's kind of like, you know, the disciples wake up, they're stretching, and they're like, what are we going to do today, Jesus? Are we going to go heal some people? And Jesus is like, what day is it? Uh, it's Thursday, Jesus. Ah, oh, no, we've got to wait a couple days. Why can't we heal people on Thursdays, Jesus? Well, we're not going to make any religious elites mad at us if we do that. We're not going to freak anybody out. Uh, just as a side note, sometimes I think we portray Jesus as, like, very non-offensive. And when we actually look at stories like this in the gospel, Jesus is purposefully offensive sometimes. He purposely offends people's sensibilities when their sensibilities run counter to the love of God in the gospel. Jesus will go out of his way to offend that. And that seems pretty clear here. So they were divided about that. Some thought he was on God's side. Some people didn't. So they asked the guy who Jesus was, and he says, he's a prophet. And even though we know Jesus is more than that, that's about the highest thing he could have reasonably said about Jesus at that point. I mean, he only heard a few words, and maybe he saw him for a little bit. And, you know, after he had mud put in his eyes. There's a very small number of prophets in the Old Testament who perform miracles, and so he's saying, yeah, he's on the side of God, duh, he's a prophet. The Pharisees don't like that answer, and so they go to his parents, QC and 3, and they ask three questions to the blind man's parents. They ask, one, is this your son? Yup. Was he born blind? Yup. How does he see? And they don't answer. They had heard that anyone confessing Jesus would be put out of the synagogue. And to be put out of the synagogue in that day didn't just mean you don't, you know, you don't get to go to the church for a couple weeks. It meant you were actually ostracized from your community. Not just from your religious community, but from your social community too. And they didn't want that. So they said, he's old enough, go ask him. Scene four, final scene of the investigation. The second time the Pharisees talked to the man, but... This is the second time they talk to him, but this time it kind of takes more of the form of an interrogation. So when they say, if you look at verse 24, when they say, give glory to God, that's not just a form of greeting. It's actually a means of inter interrogation from the Old Testament. We see that in Joshua. And there's a sense of, tell the truth before God or else. They think he's hiding something that would allow them to kind of fit what had happened to the man with what they know of Jesus, that he's a sinner. And so the man says, I don't know if he's a sinner. All I know is that I was born blind, and now I see. So they asked him again, maybe trying to see if he could help keep his story straight. And I love this part. He's, um, I don't know if you've ever been such a fan of a TV show or, uh, I don't know, a book series or something that you get into, like, the weeds of discussing this with other people, and you start to talk about, like, what your favorite side characters are and stuff like that. Um, I think I've decided that, at least in the Gospels, this is my favorite side character, right? This blind beggar. Because at this point, he gets a little sassy. And he gets a little sarcastic. And that's my primary knee-jerk reaction in situations like this. Or I, I, I should say, like, in all of life, this is my primary knee-jerk reaction, is to be sassy and sarcastic. I've probably sinned against some of you with that before, so I'm sorry. Um, and that's what he does. So he says, I told you already, you wouldn't listen. What, do you want to hear it again? Do you all want to become his disciples too? <laughs> but having sass as a defense me mechanism, I found, doesn't always make people happy. 
And in verse 28, we see that the Pharisees revile him. And that word for revile there um, means to abuse a person to his face insultingly. They were enraged and they said that they were disciples of Moses, not this guy Jesus, wherever he's from. And he continues with his sass saying, well, that's amazing. He did all this stuff that only God can do. And you're saying you don't know where it comes from. Huh. So they did to him what his parents were scared of, and they cast him out. He was cast out of the synagogue from his worship and from his community. So he's gone from being a blind, helpless beggar, you know, like down in the, in the depths. And then he goes and he's, he can see everything. Life is good. And then now, suddenly, he's cast out. He's suffering. They told him to get lost. And so what does Jesus do? Jesus comes and gets him. Jesus comes and finds him. And he reveals, Jesus reveals himself to the Son of Man, and he says, you've seen him. If you look at that in the latter part of our passage this morning, he says, you've seen the Son of Man. That's interesting wording, isn't it? Because this is the first time that he has really seen Jesus. He was blind. Jesus healed his blindness, and so he finally sees Jesus spiritually. He's spiritually seeing Jesus now. Look at those last three verses in our chapter, starting in verse 39. Jesus said, For judgment I came into the world, that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard these things and said to him, Are we also blind? Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say, we see, your guilt remains. What does that mean? If you admitted you were blind, if you said, we know we're in darkness. We know we're sinners. We know we're desperate, as desperate as a blind beggar. I could do something about that. I have the light you need. I can make you see. But since you say you can... You're going to stay in your sin. What Jesus is saying is, you are blind. You are desperate. We're all desperate. We have this disease of original sin. We can't come to God on our own. Sin, evil, wickedness, it's infected our souls. We have a problem. We are desperate. It's infected our souls. It's infected our bodies. Sin's infected our minds. Jesus is saying, you're, you're blind beggars, convincing yourselves you're not. And unless you can acknowledge that reality and come to me in your desperation, there won't be any healing. You're desperate. Acknowledge your desperation. We're all desperate. It's about acknowledging our desperation. The closest application of this story for those who don't believe, who don't yet acknowledge their desperate needs, need for Jesus is to do that, to let him come and heal you. What about for those of us who have believed? How do we process this story? Some of you may have seen me on a very rare occurrence where I'm wearing glasses. Um, may have shared this with some of you before, but I usually wear contacts. I'm wearing contacts right now. I'm very blind without them. If I took them out right now, it would both be gross and you'd all be blobs, very colorful blobs, but blobs. Um, and I'm really bad about taking out my contacts. I have optometrist friends that um, like make fun of me and say that they're going to make a lot of money off me someday. Because uh, I never take out my contacts. The contacts, uh, I, I, I actually just the week before I prepared this sermon, um, I took my, out my contacts that I probably had in for like nine or ten months. Um, I wear them till they hurt my eyes, and then I take them out when they hurt, and I hear my cornea going, <sighs> and then I wear glasses for a couple of days, and I, you know, put a new pair of contacts in. My current pair I'll probably have in until uh, mid-2024. Um, I know it's very unhealthy. Uh, I can go days or weeks without even remembering that I have contacts in. Like, seriously, I don't even think about it. And I assume on those days that I don't even think about it, that I, by myself, have awesome eyesight. I have 20-20 eyesight. And I forget that I'm actually desperately, nearsightedly blind. Not legally, but you know what I'm saying. 
I forget that I actually need and I'm desperate for these contacts if I even want to see anything. And as Christians, I think that's us sometimes. That's how the New Testament goes on to describe Christians who are stuck and stagnant and lukewarm. Peter, who was with Jesus here in the story and who had witnessed Jesus giving sight to the blind, he says later in his letter in 2 Peter 1, he says, Make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to this. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. So the cause, Peter is saying here, the cause of Christian stagnation, the cause of Christian stuckness, the cause of um, just being in, you know, stuck in these sinful patterns is nearsightedness. That's what Peter is saying. Yeah, Jesus, he opened my eyes a long time ago, but it's getting kind of fuzzy now. You're so far removed from being the desperate blind beggar at Jesus' feet that you assume sight. Yeah, I'm doing pretty good. Also, look at Revelation 3 through John, um, who wrote out the passage today. He, he wrote, um, he's writing um, a letter from Jesus. So this is what Jesus is saying to a church in a place called Laodicea. And here's what he says. I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So, because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing. Not realizing that you are wretched, you are pitiable, you are poor, you are blind, and you are naked. And I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich. White garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen. And listen to this. Salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. So when the disciples saw this story about Jesus healing the man born blind, and they took it out and they wanted to apply it to the early church, what they said is, if you are lukewarm, and I'm saying this to you guys and me, if we're lukewarm, if we're not feeling it, if we're bored with Jesus, if we're stuck in our sins, if we are just stagnant, stagnant and not going anywhere, if we're not feeling it, if we're not there, if we're not growing, the reason, the, the primary reason is not because you're not doing enough stuff, right? We live in this society where um, right now, it's really easy, like our knee-jerk reaction when we don't feel like we are where we should be is to what? You look for self-improvement books. You, you know, I mean, when I go on an Instagram, like it's either pictures of, you know, um, pretty people in pretty places doing pretty things, or it's self-improvement. It's here are all these stuff. You want to be a better makeup wearer? You want to be a better vacation taker? You want to be a better worker? You want to be a better man, a better woman, a better X, Y, Z? Here are all the steps that you can take. And so when we feel stagnant, when we, when we feel lukewarm, when we feel stuck in our faith, when we feel like we're not growing with Jesus or in our relationship with the Lord, it can be tempting to say, man, I just need to do more. I need to do all of these things and follow all of these steps. And there might be, you know, things that you can do to help in your relationship with the Lord, right? Like spiritual disciplines are good, and I'm not saying they're not. But if the first step is not a deep acknowledgement within the pit of your soul that you are desperate in need for Jesus, then that's your problem. And that's what the New Testament writers are saying. You've forgotten that you're blind. You've forgotten that without Jesus, you can't see. So that's my first acknowledgement of the story. Acknowledge your desperation. Acknowledge your desperation. I don't know why the man's name is not recorded here, but it does sure make it easy to put your own name in there, doesn't it? See yourself as the blind beggar. I don't know what that'll take for you to get back to that place that maybe you were at a while ago, but you 
aren't really at now. Maybe that means remembering who you were before Jesus. Maybe that means getting real with the Lord this week and acknowledging the sins or the suffering that are in your life that um, make you feel help, helpless and desperate today and turning those over in prayer to the Lord. Or maybe it means being like an awkward assistant pastor sitting in an art gallery using his glasses to cover up his tears before Beckman's Christ in the center in the St. Louis Art Museum. Because maybe the way Beckman painted the woman caught in adultery, you know, if you look at that, she's, um, if you look at that painting, she's in the, in the bottom corner. Like, she's almost so low in the painting, you feel like you could kind of just take her out and take her place. So you could identify with her. It's easy to picture yourself in her place, too. Just like the blind beggar, hands clasped, asking Jesus, begging Jesus. For, mer for mercy, with Jesus right before you, again, holding back the crowds and embracing you with his hand. But I want to say one more thing, because that can sound really dr dark and dreary, doesn't it, right? You're desperate. Acknowledge your desperation. Okay, Sam. But there's a bounciness that this guy has, right? Like, this guy has a little levity to him, doesn't he? I mean, this guy started out, and he was begging for money so he, he could survive because he was physically unable to provide for himself. He was the epitome of desperation. And just a little bit of spit mud from Jesus, and a few minutes later, he's sassing the Pharisees. The guys that have control over his very place in the world, in Judaism, in his society, and he's just kind of clowning on them, right? He's joking with them. And please don't hear... You hear me saying, like, you guys got to, you know, be the jokey, smiley person all the time. Or that you need to have or, or give off youth pastor vibes, which I've been told that I have, if you can believe that or not. Um, or that you never can weep or mourn. Sometimes our causes for dreariness can be neurological or affected by a lot of things in our life. And in fact, we started off today by talking about suffering, right? This guy was suffering. And he suffers throughout this story. So now you're telling me you have to have, you know, this faith with some bounce and levity. Which is it? Look at the blind man. He experienced the depths of suffering. He was desperate. But because his desperation was met by Jesus, because he acknowledged it, and he, he took it to Jesus, and his desperation was met by Jesus, he walked with a bounce in his step. He faced the anti-gospel culture of the Pharisees that made him an outcast with a semi-smile. You can picture him kind of smirking when he's talking to him. So we do have all this weighty stuff in life. And there are seasons of mourning, yeah, and all that. But those who remember that they're blind beggars given sight by Jesus bear that weight like an astronaut. So if you look at, like, pictures of Buzz Aldrin or other astronauts, like when they're on the moon... They're bouncing around. I mean, I know that hasn't happened in a while, but you see pictures of an astronaut bouncing around out there. Like, those, those suits, they weigh like 300 pounds, right? Without the astronaut in them. They weigh like 300 pounds. And on the moon, um, so, so with the astronaut in them, on the moon, it's like 500 pounds, and they're just bouncing around. They have all this weight on them, but they're just bouncing around. And just like that, we can, even though we have all this weight, we have the weight of the world, we have the weight of suffering, we have the weight of mourning, we have the weight of sin that we still live with in this world. Yet we can have a sense of joy in our desperation, levity amidst the hardship, bounciness because of Jesus. And there's a beauty to that. So if your Christian walk right now is marked by dreariness, grumpiness, Lack of joy, lack of growth, stuck, stagnant, lukewarmness. Maybe the answer isn't to make a big list of steps. Maybe the answer isn't to convince yourself that you're all right, just keep going, it's fine. Maybe the answer is that you're in a more desperate situation than you actually think you are. The founder of the missionary organization, Surge, Jack Miller, um, had this quote where he said, Cheer up. You're a worse, worse sinner than you ever dared imagine, and you're more loved than you ever dared hope. That's beautiful. That kind of desperation 
that leads you to joy, it's beautiful. When I was wor- looking at um, Beckman's other paintings of other like desperate situations, it was clear that he found beauty in them. And actually on one of the placards like next to the paintings in St. Louis Art Museum, um, next to one of Beckman's paintings, it says he found a colorful beauty in desperation. I think Jesus does too. And I think we can too if we acknowledge our desperation and take it to Jesus. There's a colorful beauty to be had in acknowledging ourselves as blind beggars at the feet of Jesus and letting him once again give us sight and give us life. Let's pray. Lord, um, we live in a place where it's really easy for us to convince ourselves that we don't have any need um, to project this image of ourselves as put together and confident, competent at everything, having everything together. And Lord, if we take that into our relationship with you, that can be, that can be deadly for us, God. Because we are desperate. We're desperate for you. We're desperately in need of you right now. But Lord, sometimes it's hard to acknowledge that. It's hard to feel that. It's hard to get back to that place where it's just us with our need coming to you, kneeling at your feet. Help us to get there, God. Help us to remember our desperation. Help us to bring it to you and give us new sight again. Amen.